computers are really good at rules. The humans are trying to follow the rules, but what people don't realize is the humans created the rules and it's the humans that know how to break the rules. And that's the one thing we have in humanity that's going for us is our ability to see between the lines, the ability to connect things that people might not have seen, that level of intuition you can't today repeat yet with cognition in a computer. What we're all trying to grasp with is how do we get from today's world to the Star Trek economy where nobody works for money, right? And it's a very interesting kind of situation, right? We are in the middle of that transition. How fast does automation occur? Will we be able to learn or reskill quicker than the automation that's occurring? Will the machines actually do more work more quickly than we can? But I think one of the things that we do have to understand is that humans are very adaptable. Uh, there is I saw The Matrix on my way to a AI conference, and at the middle of the movie, I realized something very interesting. In The Matrix, and I know I'm digressing, but this is what's interesting. Uh, in The Matrix, the computers are really good at rules. The humans are trying to follow the rules, but what people don't realize is the humans created the rules, and it's the humans that know how to break the rules. And that's the one thing we have in humanity that's going for us, is our ability to see between the lines, the ability to connect things that people might not have seen, that level of intuition you can't today repeat yet with cognition in a computer, and not for some time. And that's the good news. Now, the bad news is the fact that there are things that we do without thinking. There's a lot of automation that will go away. And so how will we support that? A lot of people are talking about population reduction. A lot of people are talking about how we look at resources. A lot of people are trying to figure out maybe we tax computers and robots for their work. Um, I don't know if those are really good models, but I think we do have to think about this issue very seriously. So how is Silicon Valley thinking about these issues? I think Silicon Valley is scared. <laughs> they are so scared. Like in one of our futures papers, we said that, look, we think that at some point there will be a terrorist attack in Silicon Valley because it's the valley that's creating all these things that are potentially destroying jobs, taking away privacy, changing the way people work, right? On the other hand, the valley has created a lot of innovations which give people hope and, you know, prospects, right? You think about what Tesla has done and Elon Musk in terms of thinking about space exploration or thinking about energy. And so there's both sides of the equation, but I think in the Valley there needs to be some realization and humility as to what has occurred. Do you think tech entrepreneurs are pushing it a little bit too far at the moment? I don't think so yet. I don't think we've pushed the limits yet. I think you're going to see a little bit more before we actually get to some balance. Okay, and how so? Well, I think what's going to happen, and this is what I don't, I do not wish this on the Valley, is in the last era of industrial technology revolution, governments got involved, tried to regulate the amount of work, tried to regulate everything to the point where there was no innovation. Tech is the last bastion of free market capitalism. It is the last bastion of innovation. And when you take that away, you will lose that innovation. People will say, well, it's for social good. Or people will say, hey, we've actually created more human tech. Um, the reality is overregulation hampers innovation. And if you want innovation, the tech community has to learn to police itself and has it learned to actually understand the implications of that technology in broader terms and in more inclusive terms. So what's the role of governments in all of this? You're asking a very tough question about how governments can help with technology. And the challenge with governments, and no offense to the legislators that are there, but most of them are not qualified to even understand what's going on, right? You take a country like China where they, you know, there's 98% of the legislators have engineering and science degrees. They understand the technology implications. You come to the US, that's like 3%. Right, that might even have a doctor's degree or a medicine degree or science degree. They don't have the chops to understand what's going on and they all rely on lobbyists. And the lobbyists all rely on where's the nearest buck to be made. So that's not a very good model, right? And so I, I don't have a lot of hope for technology and policy to catch up with each other. I just hope that we don't make really bad policy decisions. Now, in that vein, there are certain things that are important. There are fundamental human rights that should be ensured the right to privacy, 
right? And that means ensuring that citizens have control of their own data, ensuring that citizens, like being disconnected should not be a alarm that you're doing something nefarious, right? Being disconnected means I choose not to be tracked. That should be okay, right? When we talk about things like cryptocurrencies, if I cannot transact anonymously, you've taken away a right. And that is something governments can do to protect, is to protect how that information is provided, to make sure that individuals have the ability to have choice as to what information they want to reveal. And more importantly, they do have to create a level playing field. And when I mean a level playing field is one that ensures competition, not one that takes away competition. A level playing field is one that encourages investment and innovation, not one that hampers them for lobbyists or for unions or for regulators or for a tax break or for a treaty. It doesn't matter where we go. Now, why am I saying this? Because the fallacy of Western democracy or the failure of Western democracy is that we've run out of votes to be bought. Right? Let me give you free health care. Let me buy you a tax break. Let me give you housing. Whoa, let me give you this trade deal. Right? Those were all forms of buying votes. And what we've gone to is a system in Western democracy where money actually influences the legislation to an unfair balance. And so what we can at least try to do is at least save an international human right, which is privacy. Do you think some countries have a leg up on innovation policy? I think the challenge right now with governments guiding and technology policies, we also don't know what the implications may be. Right? You can make certain bets on technology policies and hope you do well. Uh, and sometimes you do well. You bet big, you win. I mean, that's what venture capitalists do all the time. However, when it comes to humans, I think where we are at this point is the technology policies don't necessarily reflect what the potential outcomes may be. And so let's take an example, like, you know, look at Japan and semiconductors or South Korea and semiconductors. We flood a market, we glut the market, and suddenly like, there's only like two vendors left in the market because no one can afford the capital to jump in, right? We think about something like biotech and biosciences where we have rules because of our religious beliefs and our ethical beliefs, which are wonderful, some would say, and other people would say, this is horrible. You're harming the future of stem cell research and the ability of pioneering innovation. And so I think what's important to realize is that different countries countries will adopt their values. We need to respect their values and their point of view. But there are also some things that are greater human values that will change over time that we will all say, hey, that's really a bad thing to do. We should all stop doing that. So we'll get there over time. But when we try to force that onto people, either by political parties or by oppression, we don't get a lot of good results. If we influence people or shame people, we usually get better results over time. What do you think is kind of a surprise that's on the horizon? I think the big surprise is that people are going to realize that those who have been very successful in Silicon Valley may not care about as much about the money, but as more about a legacy. And we're actually going to see a shift in the valley of more social good. And I think that's a very, very important thing. The ability to actually, where people are actually working towards bigger ideas. There's one that's very interesting. Think about what uh, Vint Cerf and Mei Ling Fung are doing in the people-centered internet. They're trying to democratize access to the internet across all areas, trying to ensure how, what people, what, what it might look like, right? Um, there are questions we often ask people, like what rights does a baby have on day one when they're born in the year 2100? And people always answer, it depends what country they're in. Okay, yeah, okay, it depends on what country, right? But what would be a universal set of rights that they have and then a set of privileges that they must earn and a set of responsibilities that they should be working towards. And when you start thinking in those terms, you start understanding how people are gonna look at their future and their legacies. Are there also some things that scare you about technology and the future? I'm scared that we don't have a good framework for AI ethics, but I'm more scared when we try to apply a universal framework to everybody on AI ethics. And so that is going to be the balance that we get to. People are going to say, oh, that is completely evil. Now, I'll give you a fun example. I don't know if this, it was used before, but autonomous vehicles, right? You get two, two cars get into an accident, right? And the accident occurs in China and someone hits, a, hits someone and someone gets injured, right? In China, the algorithm might be 
run that person over three more times because it's cheaper than keeping them alive, right? That's the financial cost benefit. In Canada, it might be, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, how can I help you? People will be very polite, I'm taking stereotypes to the extreme, but you get what I'm saying, right? In Russia, it might be, no, none of us did it, everyone deny plausibility, and you know, here's the video cam that's been doctored. All right. And I don't know, right? But this is my point. These are all interesting examples that may occur. Right, so, so I think what we're trying to figure out is what is the universal human code and we can't answer that question. And in the meantime, I think we're gonna push the limits and when we get to that crucial point, I hope the populace is educated enough when they make their decision, right? And that's the thing. I think we need to continue to educate people on the implications of technology, what it means to your life, what it means to your business, what it means to society. And we need to actually take a much more holistic view. And what would be a holistic view? I think a holistic view is to understand those implications, right? Um, what happens if we all went to cryptocurrencies and, and someone hacked the cryptocurrency? What happens if we went to cryptocurrencies and you decided to buy something and the government said, by the way, since you have free health care from us, you really should lay off the wine. <laughs> Right? People don't think about these things. Right? So, so I think people should, should at least understand those implications um, in free thought. I think academia at this moment has been polluted by grants and corporate grants and where people are being paid to be spokespeople but aren't really providing real research. So I hope we get to back to a point where we still value the truth, value the pursuit of the truth, um, and also, well, something is a concept in the U U.S., but we have this notion of a pursuit of happiness where we don't invade other people's rights, but we pursue what we're interested in. And I think we can get back to that. Do you think we're perhaps overestimating what technology can do for us? Um, I thought we saw a little bit of that in the early 2000s, where we believed that everything could be digital. Um, in that point, it was called cyber, which was kind of fun, right? But everything could be digitized and we know, no one really had to do any work, right? I mean, there, there's a lot to do from here to the Star Trek economy. <laughs> and I wish Gene Roddenberry was back. I mean, we can go back in time. That's the one guy we want to interview. How'd you get here? <laughs> like, how do you get there? And how do folks get to the point where they work to the things that they're interested in and there's enough energy, there's enough food, there's enough something to sustain what people want to do, right? No society is perfect, but that sounds very interesting in a utopian world. Uh, unfortunately, we have all these dystopian movies, which actually help make us think about things a little bit more carefully around topics such as privacy or technology adoption or you know, things that we don't we'd normally think about. What the public can do around being more informed is um, there needs to be foundations. There actually needs to be institutions that help. Right? One that I love, sometimes they're a little crazy, but EFF. right? They're perfecting privacy rights. You know that. They're a little bit crazy, but you know what? At the end of the day, they mean well. That's what they're trying to do. I think other ones are really policy implications in terms of selling things. So instead of creating clickbait in the media about, you know, this technology, Uber meets this meets, you know, Taylor Swift. Okay, great. I mean, what? Great, you got clickbait. But, but at least do your job in the media and educate folks on the implications, the policy things. People might not want to hear about it. It might not be the most written article, but it's something for people to understand. Now, the second piece behind this is, you know, the technologies as we're building technology policy or people are thinking about technology policy. I really hope that our politicians spend a little bit more time to understand how these technologies impact the regular individual. Right? And, and what people are trying to get out of those technologies. And in some cases, that will direct how you build basic research grants that will help you with policies, that will help you rethink issues around jobs. Right? I know everybody's trying and really busy trying to get their votes, but you, know, you do have an obligation to serving your country and trying to think of what is best in the midterm and the long term, which is very hard to do in today's environment. How can users make the most of today's technologies? Well, the challenge with most technology is users get excited about a shiny object and they're like, oh, this is great, this is the best thing I've ever had. However, you need to go back to the basics. The first principles are, what are the business objectives? What are you trying to do? You need to get better at asking the questions of what you want to achieve. When we think about the art of the possible, we always start by saying, what, what do you want to accomplish? Where do you want to go? Why do you want to do something different? And you have to have that deep introspection to say, okay, here's where I want to go. And then you can come back and say, hey, these are some interesting technology. So form always follows function, but people forget that all the time. We try to reverse engineer something. Like, you know, take this, take a house, right? 
do you really need that much home automation? The trouble to get to that home automation may not even be worth what you're trying to accomplish, right? So you have to go back and say, what, what did you really want to do? Well, I want to be able to walk in, the lights turn on. Okay, a, a switch would do. <laughs> or yeah, at least a sensor switch would do, right? But by the time you program your whole house and do it, but it might be cool, okay, that might be what you're trying to achieve. That's different if you're trying to push the envelope. But we also have to think outcomes. And I think that's what we always forget.